Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Teresa Marantet, CEO and Chief Nursing Officer of the Windsor Essex County Health Unit. First of all, thank you to our municipal partners in Amherstburg for another successful drive-through testing day. 531 people were tested yesterday thanks to the good work of Essex Windsor EMS, Windsor Essex CHC, police services and our own health unit staff. Drive-through random COVID-19 testing will continue today in Tecumseh at the corner of Manning and Tecumseh Road. Thank you to Choice Properties for the use of this space and to the Town of Tecumseh and their Public Works Department for the help in coordinating this initiative. Testing be will be available from 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. today. Please enter off of Manning Road. Any resident of Windsor Essex County 12 years of age or older can be tested. People will need to provide their health card number, first and last name, date of birth, and address. Please check the Ministry of Health's online portal or the link on our website to access your test results. I will now share the most current case counts. There are 93,726 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Canada and 29,403 cases in Ontario. Chatham-Kent has 147 cases and sarnia Langton has reported 267 cases. Michigan now has 58,241 cases with 11,116 cases being in Detroit. Today, we are reporting 999 cases of COVID-19 in our community, an increase of three cases from yesterday. One person is a healthcare worker, one person works in the agri-farm sector, and one person was a close contact of confirmed case. 567 cases have resolved. 15 people are in hospital. 18% of our cases are between the ages of 20 and 29 years. 18% are between the ages of 30 and 39 years. And 16% of our cases are between the ages of 40 and 49 years. 48% of our cases are male and 51% are female. And 1% is unknown at this time. Our community has lost a total of 66 people to COVID. 49 deaths have occurred among residents in long-term care and retirement homes. Our health unit is currently working with one long-term care home that is currently experiencing a COVID-19 outbreak. Testing is available for symptomatic people, those who have at least one symptom of COVID-19, even mild symptoms. And testing is also available for asymptomatic people based on their level of risk. This includes people who are concerned that they have been exposed to COVID-19, people who are contacts of confirmed case, or who may have been exposed to a confirmed or suspect case of COVID-19, and people who are at risk of exposure through their employment, including essential workers such as healthcare workers, grocery store employees, and people working in food processing plants. No one who is symptomatic or who is concerned that they have been exposed to COVID-19 will be declined to test at an assessment center. Common symptoms of COVID-19 include fever, a new or worsening cough, and shortness of breath. However, other symptoms may be present, such as a sore throat, difficulty swallowing, unexplained fatigue, an increase in falls, nausea, vomiting, chills, and headaches. To access a local healthcare provider, walk-in clinic, or virtual medical assessment, please visit ehealthwindsoressex.ca. Windsor Essex has two COVID assessment centers, Erie Shores Healthcare in Leamington and Windsor Regional Hospital at Olette Campus. SOHAC, the Southwest Ontario Aboriginal Health Access, Access Centre in Windsor, also offers testing for First Nations, Métis and Inuit people and their families. Please continue to visit our website at wuchu.org for the most current information and case counts. I will now turn it over to Dr. Wajid Ahmed, our Medical Officer of Health, for further updates regarding COVID-19. Good morning, everyone. Before we begin our epi summary, I want to talk about social and public gatherings. With the warmer weather upon us and the weekend about to start, 
I want to remind residents to get out, get active, and stay safe. Getting outdoors and staying active is an important contributor to positive mental health. However, given the hot temperatures, make sure that you're wearing sunscreen, continually hydrating with water, and wearing lightweight, breathable clothing to protect yourself from heat-related illness and injury, as well as to protect yourself from COVID when venturing outdoors, remember to maintain physical distancing two meters or six feet from others. Stay home if you're sick. Wash your hands with soap and water frequently or sanitize with alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Cough or sneeze into a, into a tissue or sleep and wear a cloth mask in settings where physical distancing cannot be maintained. I am aware that there are several marches and peaceful protests planned for this weekend. While large gatherings are not recommended and should generally be avoided, to best protect themselves against COVID-19, any attendee must wear a non-medical uh, mask, which is ensuring breathable, having breathable material, clean hands regularly with soap and water or alcohol-based hand sanitizer, do not participate if you are sick or been told to self-isolate. Maintain two meters physical distancing from everyone else. Avoid shouting or yelling. This may increase the amount of respiratory droplets and dampen your mask. In addition, shouting and yelling could compromise your ability to breathe, especially when you're wearing a mask. Now moving back to our epi summary, since the beginning of this pandemic, we know that there's a lot of misinformation out there, and if there is any confusion in the messaging, it could lead to behaviors that could put people to risk. The Windsor Essex County Health, Health Unit has always put evidence and science behind every recommendations that is being made to protect the community from the impacts of COVID-19. Now I'll move on to the happy summary. Uh, So very quickly, this is what we will cover in our presentation, and I'll focus on the key points to answer some of these questions that we ask all the time in making any of these public health recommendations. Looking at the epi curve, it helps us assess the progression of the disease, whether in the community or in an outbreak situation. This particular epi curve is shown, uh, is created to show the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases by their symptom onset date. On your vertical axis, you have number of confirmed cases. On your horizontal axis, we have the death, uh, we have the dates these cases started showing symptoms. The significance of using symptom onset date instead of the case reported date is to get a sense of when the disease transmission or exposure likely happened. This particular graph shows all cases, that is cases in the community, cases in the long-term care home and retirement home, and also cases in the agricultural industry. Please note that data presented in the shaded area may not be reported yet to public health and may not be entirely accurate and subject to change. Day-to-day -day variation can vary, can vary significantly, and we know COVID-19 do not cause disease after exposure immediately. It may take up to 14 days. In order to minimize the impact of day-to-day -day variation, another way to look at the epi curve is to look at a three-day moving average. Three-day moving average captured day-to-day -day variation and will try to present a much better picture of when the transmission infection is happening. We can see that roughly since second or third week of April, the number of confirmed cases start to go down and started to move in the right direction. In the early week of May, we noticed a further decline in the number of cases. We saw an influx in the cases in the shaded area due to the high number of cases across those working in the agri-farm industry. The increase in cases on May 20th to 23rd also happened to coincide with the four to six days after the Victoria Day long weekend. The average incubation period for COVID-19 is approximately five days, which may account for an increase in the cases, what we saw at the end of the uh, last week of uh, May. Once again, please note that the data presented in the shaded area may not be reported yet to public health and may not be entirely accurate and subject to change. 
We already know that yesterday and today we have seen a spike in the number of cases and we need to be careful and how, uh, how the number of cases look in the coming days. Uh, luckily uh, today we had uh, only three cases but these day-to-day -day variation happens all the time. This particular figure breaks down the cases by long-term care home, retirement homes, and also those working in the agriculture farm industry and everyone else not in the first two groups. We can see a spike in the cases in the last uh, last uh, third in the uh, third week of, in the month of May among those working in the agriculture farm industry. Please note that the orange bar includes both individuals who are temporary foreign workers as well as local residents who work in the uh, agri farm industry in Windsor and Essex. The next logical question comes to our mind is uh, how we are comparing it with the rest of the province and the rest of the regions. Windsor Essex currently has the fourth highest rate in the province and our rates are higher than, um, higher than the province. We have seen an increase in Haldeman Norfolk region which pushed us down to number fourth from last, uh, from last week. Windsor Essex is closer in terms of its rate with Durham and York compared to Peel region, Haldeman and Toronto. We are though higher than the province and that's, uh, that's a significant uh, number of cases that we are seeing in our community. For us here locally, we have experienced a higher proportion of cases in long-term care home and retirement home, recognizing that we have a significantly high number of long-term care home and retirement home in our region. The case counts currently was 30% of all cases uh, were from the long-term care home and retirement home, and at one point it was peaked at 42% of all cases in our region. And now we are currently seeing an increase in the number of individuals in the agriculture sector who are ill, and now they constitute roughly around 19% of our cases in the region. We've been asked how it takes for us to, how long it takes for us to receive our lab results back once we conduct a test. This figure looks at the turnaround time from when a test was done to when it was received and specifically if it was received within one day of testing and two days of testing. This looks at the past 30 days from June the 3rd. We can notice some variation in terms of when we are receiving the results. There were time when we were receiving all the results of the positive cases within 24 hours, and then there were time when it took us uh, up to 48 hours to, to receive all the positive cases. Please note that many of these cases that are positive, we are, this is just the, the graph to show positive cases. The negative cases most of the time are accessed directly by the individual, so we do not have an indi indication of when these tests, uh, when the negatives were reported. So this only includes the positive ones. It shows when, by the time when the test was conducted and the time that we received the positive results. Uh, looking at the past two weeks to see how, how we were doing the initiating the case, con uh, case investigation within 24 hours of the reported date, and in the last two weeks, we predominantly investigated 100% of our cases within 24 hours of receiving a lab result. If not within 24 hours, it is investigated within 48 hours. Some of these variations are not limited by our staff ability to contact, uh, to, to start the initiate investigation, but it's limited by the individual or the contact information that was provided to us and the delay in, in reaching out to that individual and making that connection with the, with the health unit. Uh, our EP team noted a shift in the age group uh, when we plotted this, uh, this data to show the age sex distribution starting from May 16th to June 3rd, with the age group more, with more positive cases among the younger group. Since May 16th, the new cases are significantly high between the ages of 20 to 39 year uh, age group. Additionally, 72% of the cases in the past two weeks were male. I would like to remind the importance of physical distancing, appropriate hand washing and respiratory etiquette, and most frequently staying home when you're sick to everyone, but more specific to the individuals who belong to this group, male and younger people between the ages of 20 to 39. The number of cases, the, the positive cases are high in that particular age group. So I think it is important for anyone who is in that age group and everyone else to continue to follow all the measures that's been recommended to you. 
The next graph shows the distribution of COVID-19 cases by municipality, and currently just over 50% of cases are from Windsor, and the rest are from the county. We are seeing 22% of our cases from Leamington, and this is due to the uptake in cases in the agri-farm sector. Significant differences in the number of cases in some of the municipality is due to the high number of positive cases in the long-term care home and retirement home. We've been asked about the hotspot. Please note that there is a big risk if you're just trying to limit yourself to the cases where we are. Everywhere in the region, anywhere you go in Windsor and Essex, please be prepared that you may come in contact with a case or uh, someone who could be a case. You have to take precaution irrespective of where you live, irrespective of where you go. So please do not think that one municipality or one area is better than the other. You should treat every location, every place by default as a high risk or a hotspot and take appropriate precautions to protect yourself, your family, and everyone around you. Through the extensive contact tracing the health unit is carrying out, we are able to identify the majority of the exposures as close contacts, as you can see in this particular graph. This can include close contacts in a household, long-term care home, retirement home, other congregate settings such as shelters and migrant farms. This also shows the impact of our measures. If we can track down most of the cases to a close contact, that means we are reducing the community spread. If you look at cases in the last few weeks or, or more than a month, most of these new cases are happening in close contacts, and we also need to reduce the number of close contacts to limit the number of new cases that we are seeing. So this particular graph we created to show the difference between what is happening from a respect of community transmission and how many, what proportion of the cases are coming from the community transmission. So I just want to pause on this slide to make sure that I, that everybody understand what this particular graph mean. This is something that we look at or we will be looking at to identify the extent of spread in the community and to the, to the relative risk of what, what is happening in the community. There is no set marker to say what percentage of or what proportion of cases if it's coming from the community would be, uh, would be a standard to say we're doing good or we're doing bad. But what we would like to see is the number, is proportion of these cases going down. And so this particular graph is showing over the last, uh, uh, since the beginning, what proportion of cases are coming from, uh, are acquired in the community and what does it mean? A word of caution, what you're looking here is a percentage, it's not the absolute number. So it really is dependent on the number of cases per day and those cases identified, uh, identifying an exposure. For example, if you have two cases today and one identified community exposure, the percentage would be 50%. Similarly, if we had 20 cases and 10 identified as community exposure, the percentage would still be 50%. So what we are focusing on is to, uh, to, is to provide you with the breakdown of the cases in the community to help better understand that where these cases are and exposures are happening and these cases are coming from. Looking to the breakdown by healthcare status, a uh, healthcare worker status, still around 23% of the cases in our community are health in healthcare worker. And, and uh, out of these cases, uh, roughly 24% of, the, of these cases travel to Michigan. About 5% of these cases visited a healthcare facility before getting infected. This highlights the importance of following the infection prevention and control measures, in, especially in the health sectors or anywhere where these healthcare workers are employed to protect the most vulnerable in the, in the hospitals, long-term care home, retirement home, and other congregate settings. Another question that's frequently asked if we had any underlying chronic health conditions uh, on, in the cases, and roughly around 35% of these cases had some kind of a medical condition where it was chronic or if they were immunocompromised in some way. A quick look at the most common symptoms that people are presenting. Uh, cough is still the most predominant symptoms in all the cases uh, in Windsor and Essex, followed by fever, malaise, fatigue, and headache. Please note that these cases can report more than one symptom, and that is why the numbers will not add up. Now looking at the number of hospitalization and patients in ICU in, in a given day, 
It can include both new patients and existing patients with COVID-19. Cases in the ICU remain relatively low for the past couple of weeks at approximately three or so cases. This past week, there has been only one individual in ICU with COVID. The red line indicates the seven-day moving average in the ICU, showing a decrease and positive trend in the ICU. Hospitalization have fluctuated more so than the ICU. We are once again seeing a decline in hospitalization related to COVID. Looking at the health system capacity uh, in Windsor and Essex, the orange line highlights the occupancy rate of our acute care beds in Windsor and Essex. The threshold is to have the occupancy rate to be below 85%, which we are currently meeting. This signals that we are currently able to meet the demands related to COVID and also to meet the needs of the community from a healthcare perspective. For ICU capacity, we'll look at the overall ICU capacity and ICU ventilator beds. While there is no established th uh, threshold, overall we are aiming to be less than 50% for overall, overall ICU beds occupied. However, then this may lead to stress to the healthcare system if COVID-19 increases within the Windsor and Essex. So looking at the, uh, the outcome on all the cases in Windsor and Essex, uh, majority of them are more than 50% of these cases are now resolved. Uh, roughly around 7% of the cases uh, uh, lost their lives to fighting COVID and around 30% or uh, slightly over 3% are still in self-isolation with roughly 1.5% hospitalized and 0.2% uh, in ICU. Looking at the age and sex breakdown of COVID-19 deaths in our community, overall more female died with COVID diagnosis compared to males. From an age distribution perspective, almost three quarters of these deaths was in, were in individuals who were 80 years and older. The youngest person died was in his 30s. This particular graph shows what it means for an individual who contracts COVID-19 in our community. The overall case fatality rate is 6.8%, a further decrease from last week. Those who are living in the long-term care home and retirement home, case fatality rate is significantly high compared to the, pro uh, compared to the community, which is 16% in this particular age group. As of May 27th, the case fatality rate in all of Ontario is 8.1% which is higher than the Windsor-Essex region. In the long-term care home and retirement home across Ontario, the case fatality rate is still higher compared to, uh, compared to the Windsor-Essex region. This number could vary depending on how the Ministry of Public Health Ontario provides their data, and this is uh, a comparison with the, with the province with, the, with our local data. The doubling time tell us how many days it will take us to see twice as many COVID-19 cases in the region. It tells us how quickly COVID-19 is spreading in our area. This specific figure looks at our doubling rate since our first case was reported. Currently, we are well past five days, considering in late March and early April, we were doubling every two days, and we can see the flattening of the curve in this particular graph. The general direction we are moving in as a country provincially and locally seems to be good. You can still see the variability in the number of our cases in our region due to the small number of cases relative to the entire province and the entire country. Based on the trend and current doubling time, we are better than the province and the country today. Our doubling rate has generally been higher for large parts of the pandemic, and having a high doubling time means we're doing better than the, uh, than the comparators. In the past 14 to 15 days, there was, a dec uh, there was a decrease in the provincial doubling time green line, and as reported by the province, the case counts were higher than expected, about, uh, about 400 new cases each day at certain times, and as a result, the doubling time also stalled. The most recent estimated mean R0 uh, today is uh, 0.56. And in, 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 in order to make it meaningful for everyone to understand when the R0 is less than one, that means each existing infection causes less than one new infection. We are currently well below this number and continue to see a declining trend. If the R0 exceeds one, 
that means each inf existing infection will cause more than one new infection. And if that continues to happen, we'll continue to see the multiplication of these cases and continue to see a significant increase in our community. We did see an increase in the middle of May with our cases, though the R0 is once again trending downwards. The shaded area demonstrates the variation that we, that we can see in, our, in, in, uh, in the mean, mean R0 uh, that's, that's there. One caveat or one important uh, uh, information to consider that this mean R0 is not the absolute mean, uh, absolute R0. This is based on and is taking into consideration that all the current public health measures that are currently in place. If you remove all those uh, these measures, the R0 could be different. That means people will have be, will be infecting more, um, uh, will creating new additional cases and the case count will continue to increase in the community. So please mind, uh, please be a uh, note uh, uh, of consideration. This is based on what is currently in place and it could change significantly depending on what new measures or how we react in the community, how we behave in the community and how important it is for us to continue to follow what we are following if we want to see a declining trend in the, uh, in the new cases in our community and reduce the number of, uh, reduce the mean R0 uh, in our community. So in summary, we continue to see decline in the case counts. Uh, Windsor Essex has the fourth highest rate in the province. Primary source of exposure is still through close contact with the confirmed case. Hospitalization and ICU capacity are within the expected thresholds and we never see the surge. Uh, our not effective value is less than one, signaling a decline in the spread of COVID-19 cases in our community. Thank you. from the media. We'll start with CBC. Uh, good morning. Um, Dr. Ahmed, yesterday Premier Ford had some pretty positive comments to say about um, the health unit here in Windsor, Essex and, and the testing we're doing. How did that make you feel when you heard that yesterday? It, it is a, definitely an endorsement of all our staff uh, who is working uh, uh, tirelessly to make all these things happen for the region, for the community, and it's not only just on these uh, dry through testing, but also on everything that we are doing, uh, from starting from the, the most common case and contact management, as well as going all the way to support all our community partners in everything that they're doing. We recognize that uh, public health is central and uh, is involved in many of the things, so it, it is appreciative to, to see that uh, uh, response from the province, and I'm sure our staff would, would be, uh, we're very happy to see that their, all their efforts are recognized uh, by the province as well. So it, it's, it's a good sign, and I'm sure that it will motivate our staff to continue to do the good job that they're doing. Um, in your summary, uh, we did see doubling time has dipped down, but there has been a bit of a spike, um, as you said, post the long Victoria Day weekend. How concerned are you about those numbers that we're seeing now? So I think that's, uh, that's why it is important for us to, to understand that how the disease is spreading and what is our role as an individual, as the agency, as the businesses, and everyone who is affected by it. We will expect to see these ups and downs depending on what is happening and specific day, specific event. So when we're talking about the, the spike that possibly have resulted because of the Victoria Day weekend, it was a long weekend, it was very nice outside, many people went outside, and possibly that they didn't follow some of the recommendations from us. So as we recognize that as we continue to move forward in positive direction, there may be um, there may be a change in behavior when people are thinking that they are out of the woods. They are not. We still have to continue to follow in the same direction to continue to limit the number of new cases. And uh, it is important that you know we do not get distracted by if we are getting less cases, that means we are fine. No, we are not. We can only make it fine if we continue to practice what we are doing. And over the time, I, I, I feel that many of the people have uh, made a number of changes in their behavior. We would like to them to continue to follow those behaviors. And those who are uh, still struggling to, to follow the public health recommendations, I would strongly advise them to, to, uh, to follow those recommendations to protect themselves and everyone around them. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Any questions from Blackburn? 
When you're seeing the resolved number of cases continues to go up, does that mean there are less cases in the community? I mean, you're say, I mean, you just kind of said the fact that people should still be concerned. There's not a less of a risk because there are less active cases. Well, that, yes, uh, it's right. So we are seeing an increase in the number of resolved cases. And when we are seeing resolved cases based on the science and based on the evidence, we can treat them that they are no longer infectious or no longer can spread it to the other individuals. What the, the rest of the active cases right now, majority of them are in self-isolation. A very few number of them are in, hospital, uh, are in the hospital settings. So even though from that perspective, they are self-isolating. What we are concerned about these people who may be either not aware of their diagnosis, they never got tested, they could still be outside, or they could be in, an, in, a, in a, having a symptoms which may not be severe enough to, for them to warrant any medical care or go to the assessment center, they can still be out there in the community. So when we are saying that the risk is still out there, it's not about from those who are currently active cases, it's about those who may have mild cases or who may not have been identified by anyone to be a case, but they could still be out there. That's why the community transmission is happening. So when we are talking about as an overall goal for the community, if every one of us, each one of us, me, you, everyone around us, if we are following those guidelines, those public health measures, the number of community transmission will go down significantly and uh, we will stop the spread in the community and that's how we can get rid of at least the local circulation of cases. So it is in our best interest, all of us, you, me, everyone, to continue to practice what we are doing right now to, to protect our community, ourselves, and our loved ones. Any questions from CTV? Hey, Josh. Happy Friday. Friday. Um, Border City Boxing Club is set to open this morning with ribbon cutting at 11 a.m. Uh, they're really excited, I know that. Um, there are businesses, however, that are on the sidelines looking at them in jealousy. So I'm just wondering, is there a sense on when the next phase may kick in? So what we heard from the Premier that uh, they are looking into some of the evidence and maybe looking at some of the evidence to see what, uh, what they can allow to open um, in the next coming weeks. Uh, so we expect to see some positive news from the from the from the province right now. Uh, unfortunately, many of these orders are under provincial directions, and uh, we would be looking forward for them to to do um, um, to to maybe open up allow some businesses to open. Then it becomes important for these businesses to to go and look at the ways to keep their employees safe, keep everyone who is attending to those businesses safe. And uh, as I mentioned uh, a few days ago before, that uh, there is a toolkit that's available on our website for all the businesses and employers to go and see what is the, what is the best practices out there, how they can use some of those high-level guidelines to, to look at their businesses and see what they need to do if they haven't done that already. I'm sure many of them are proactive and are doing many of the work, but it would be a good idea to at least look at the document to see what is needed from their preparation perspective. So if the ministry opens these services, they'll be in a position to just write, uh, get right into it. So I think uh, there are uh, uh, positive news that may, be come, that may come, uh, and we're all looking forward to it, uh, to, to try to get back to some kind of a normal that we can accept. But again, going back to the same idea, all these measures, will still mean that we still have to follow what we are doing right now. These, these public health recommendations would not go away. All the things that we are talking about, physical distancing, hand washing, staying home sick, wearing a cloth mask if you are uh, if you're unable to maintain physical distancing, all of these measures are important. So we'll have to just make it a second uh, nature of ours if we like to see uh, progress in our community. And uh, we'll have to continue to move in the direction where we can try and get on with our lives as much as possible just hang on to everybody that's gone through the measures because I know, I mean, even some of the fitness places I did stories on earlier in the week, they talked about how they were all prepared and I talked to a couple other people, other businesses that are ready to open and even sent, you know, letters to uh, the province, uh, you know, to the premier and whatnot. So um, they're ready to open. So I guess it's basically just hang on, hang tight, don't worry, it's coming. Uh, that's all I can say. Yeah. Any questions from AMA 100? Uh, no, I think I'm good. 
Any questions from Windsorite? In the slide on age breakdown, um, you had said that among young people, uh, there are higher uh, cases reported uh, between May 16th and June 3rd uh, compared to older people. Uh, you also said, you know, people are, are starting to think that they're out of the woods. Do you think that that's the reason why there's a higher number of cases among younger people? Uh, there could be a number of reasons. I think what uh, what I can think of is uh, if you're looking at the our workforce, uh, majority of our workforce is between the ages of 20 to 50 age group, and uh, they are they are outdoors. They are working. They are working in places in settings and uh, some of them may not necessarily uh, be concerned about their uh, because as a young person when i was young i was also thinking that i would never get sick uh, so there, there could be some of those behaviors that may be preventing from these individuals from uh, taking the precaution that they normally would uh, and uh, overall just because of the likelihood of if whoever will be outdoor more who will be working a setting which put them at a higher risk, they'll be at a higher risk of contracting the disease. So just identifying the particular age group, I think anyone who is who belongs to that age group, they need to look at themselves and their behavior and to maybe just take a look again and say, hey, what are we missing? What can we do to protect ourselves uh, from contracting it in the first place? So I think those are all the things that people should be uh, looking at and uh, thinking. Um, that how, uh, what they can do to protect themselves. Any questions from the Windsor Star? Uh, yes, good morning, doctor. I'm seeing some residents online saying, well, if we ignore the cases in long-term care and agri-farm populations, the community risk is really low. So why is it necessary to include those cases in uh, the total community risk when, when you're looking at the risk posed? That's a good question, and I think that's why the breakdown is important uh, and uh, ha to know exactly what it means. When we are like, when we are taking a look at all these breakdown, it helps us understand, just like you said, it's uh, it the, the breakdown where these cases are happening and how it is happening. So the how is also important. Most of these cases are it's not initiating in that particular setting. So even when we are talking about agri farm industry, some people may think that maybe they are the one who are bringing it to this country. No, they're not. They're all uh, doing their quarantine 14 days. Most of these cases that's originated in these agri-farm sector, they were all acquired here. And how would they acquire it? They acquired it in the community. So when they went out in the community, they contracted it, then they came back, then they infected other people. So there is, yes, this possibility Then, when we're talking about the number of cases that are increasing in these settings, it's just because of the, the way that uh, these individuals live, these settings and these workplaces work, operate, but the introduction of these cases are still from the community. So we do not want to undermine the importance of uh, these cases that are originating in the community and then going into these settings, which is causing much more big problem. If we are controlling the community cases, that's how we will end up in controlling it the other way around, like in, in these specific settings. So it's, uh, it is good that we are not seeing a significant number of these cases uh, resulting from a community spread perspective, but on the same hand, it is important that we see the breakdown to better understand the true picture of our community, and that's why we are breaking down these data to provide more meaningful uh, recommendations for the community. Thank you. Any further questions from CBC? No, thank you. Blackburn? No, thank you. CTV? Good, thanks. AMA 100? Windsor 8? No, thanks. Windsor Star? No, thank you. Thank you, everyone.